Come on up here, Colonel. As, we, uh, as I stated earlier, we have a very special speaker with us today. If you've been here, you can go ahead and have a seat. If, if you've been here at Bethel uh, as long as I've been, which January will be 18 years, uh, about, seven, about 16, 17 years ago, I had Colonel Wayne come and speak. And it's been long enough that y'all probably don't remember him, and a lot of you are new folks, so I said, hey, it's the time. I want to share just a moment with you a little bit about my story with what you're going to, to, to see. And, and that is that, you know, God speaks to us in many ways. The primary way is God speaks to us through his word. Another way is whenever God speaks to us through our prayers. God also speaks to us through the church. God also speaks to us through other people. And God also speaks to us through circumstances. And sometimes whenever we are just going through life, it's not that we uh, are, are always looking for the wrong kind of, or we're looking for a particular kind of, of answer to a prayer by God, give me a sign. You see, what we will do as humans is we'll say something like, God, if this is what you want me to do, then I'll let the next person I see have brown on. And you know you work for UPS. <laughs> and so, you know, that's not how we pray. But sometimes whenever we're just going through and we're praying and we're reading and we're studying and we're searching and we're, we're, we're in church and we're with other Christians, and then out of a sudden something just kind of out of the ordinary just kind of just pops up and you know it's a God moment and you know that God has just spoken to you then you know that was my experience whenever I was struggling about getting out of the Air Force and going into the ministry and I'm going to share a little bit more about that story here just in a moment but it, like I said it's an honor to have uh, Colonel Stephen Wayne with us and uh, Colonel Wayne before we, we, we get into some of the, uh, the other things and I have a, uh, let me grab something right quick. I know that, um, you're Michael. Yes, okay. I think. I, I hear turned you. it on. I hear you. Good deal. <laughs> Good deal. Yeah, mic check. Um, Colonel Wayne, first off, just want to kind of introduce you to the folks and, and let you share a little bit about yourself now. And I know some of the things, but... I know uh, you were originally from where? Well, I was born in West Virginia, but I grew up in Indiana because my dad got out of World War II at the end of 46. Couldn't find much work in West Virginia. He didn't want to be a coal miner, so uh, we moved to Indiana where my mother was from. Okay. That's where I grew up, up until I went away to college and then came in the Air Force. Yeah. Now, I know a little bit about the history with your dad. Share with these folks about your dad and how old he was. Well, I'm a person that uh, knows, remembers numbers pretty well, but I actually didn't know this until his funeral and the pastor was talking and said that uh, Henry Wayne lived to be 100 years, 10 months, and 10 days. So it was all one and zeros. <laughs> He was 51 days short of being 101. Passed away, uh, well, just uh, four years ago, last August. Now, I know that you said a while ago that your dad served in World War II. What did he do? Well, he fed the guys on the ship. That's <laughs> but, very Yes, <laughs> that's right. And uh, the funny story is that the only thing that uh, you'd have to throw overboard because nobody would eat it was mutton. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They, uh, and so I know that you grew up in a, in, in a, in a military family with your dad, you know, serving um, in World War II. And um, I know you shared a little bit about it a while ago, about your call into the military. Uh, tell us about that. I know you, you were pretty young whenever you got inspired. Well, most kids, I guess, when they're about six years old, figure they want to drive a fire engine, so be a fireman or a... Uh, even maybe a big garbage truck that comes up and down the street every week. <laughs> but uh, I decided I wanted to be an Air Force fighter pilot, flying jets. And uh, like I said before, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that, both uh, physically and mentally. Yeah. <laughs> and so you were about six years old whenever, did you see a fighter plane or a pitcher or was there 
What, what was your inspiration to want to be a fighter pilot at 16? Well, I remember it wasn't, I hadn't seen him yet, but by the time I was about 10, I saw the uh, Air Force Thunderbirds over in Dayton, Ohio, doing an air show and F-100s oh, well. going back that far. Wow. Well, uh... And the funny thing was, is later on when I was at U-Bahn flying F-4s, there was a major at my uh, squadron that was the Thunderbird solo pilot on the F-100s I'd watched when I was wow. about 10 years old. Small world. Yeah. Small world. So what year did you join? Well, let's see. You, you, tell us about your alma mater. What college did you go to? Well, I actually went to a Quaker college in Iowa called William Penn. Mm -hmm. You'd think it'd be in Pennsylvania, but it was not. And the uh, reason I went out there was because the basketball coach had been a high school basketball coach near me in Indiana, and football coach had coached at Taylor University about 20 miles away from where I grew up. They did all the recruiting back there. So I went out there and played about three different sports. But uh, my freshman year, we had 33 kids from my county that competed against each other in high school going to college in Iowa. Wow. Wow. And so. Uh, and, and I happen to know that your major was English. English. Now, that may not get you to be a fighter pilot status in this day and time. <laughs> so I guess you were correcting everybody's English when they were in the air. Is that what your part, part of your job was? <laughs> no. <laughs> they could say whatever they wanted to, however they wanted to say it. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of pilot pilots, they need a lesson in English because they can't say very much without <laughs> That's um, right. We, we can't talk without moving our hands. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, and so then, what year did you end up going into the Air Force? I started officer training school the uh, 12th of November of 1964. Wow. Yeah. And so, uh, so you started the OTS and then you went to flight school. Yes. And what all did you uh, have to train in in flight school? Well, fortunately, it was, uh, we had all jets then. I've never flown a prop plane. So we uh, started out on the T-37 made by Cessna, affectionately known as the Tweet because the engines were so high pitched. That's why I can't hear today. <laughs> but, and then after that, the T-38, which they're still flying. Yeah. 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 And then did you choose the F-4 or did the F-4 choose you? Well, the way they did it back then, based on your class standing, they had to write up on a a lot of you don't know, we used to have chalkboards, blackboards. <laughs> you know, they, they, wrote up, they wrote up there the airplanes that were available for your graduating class. And so whoever finished first, you know, the squadron would say, okay, what airplane do you want? And there were two F-105s, and I think our first and third guy took the one, two 105s. So if you wanted to be a 105 pilot and finish lower than they, you weren't going to get one. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately, there were enough F-4s, I didn't end up having to fly bombers or cargo planes. <laughs> yeah. Now, I know uh, if, if you wonder about the F-4, and, and Stephen, if this starts the video, please back me back, back up, because I'm not ready to show it, but I want it to. Yeah, no, let's don't, let's don't start that yet. All right, uh, this is a model of the F-4. And um, it was a, a, an aircraft that, at the time, that um, was a dual branch uh, aircraft in that it was actually designed for the Navy and the Marines, right? Yes. And, uh, and it had a, a <laughs> a really heavy, sturdy tail hook on it. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about a tail hook quite a bit. But the, the F-4 was designed for the Navy, for the Marines, but the Air Force ended up buying into it. But I know that one of the differences between the F-4s the Air Force flew and the F-4s the Navy and the Marines flew was that in the Air Force, the back seater in the F-4s in the, in the Air Force were actual pilots, not just weapons officers, correct? Yes, for about the first six years or so at the Air Force had the airplane. There were pilots in both cockpits. So. Yeah. And uh, 
after about 1969-70 time frames when the Air Force started putting navigators in the rear cockpit and uh, they were known as weapon systems officer. We got, we pilots that were in the back cockpit at the time I was there, we were affectionately known as Gibbs, G-I-B, guy in the back. <laughs> the, uh, I, I want to share that about the F-4 because uh, the F-4 is what inspired me. Um, I, can, I can tell you that I was at my church in Sylacauga, Alabama as a youth, as a young boy, not, not even a youth, just a young boy, and we were there doing some, some work and I heard a noise and I looked in the distance and there were two F-4s flying that looked like they were gonna hit our steeple of the church. And the, the, when they got to the church, I'm not sure if they, it was because they saw us boys out there or not, but they did a few maneuvers and they banked and we all, wow, that was cool. And I stood there with chills just all over my body. And I'm like, oh yeah. Well, everybody else went over doing what they were doing and I kept looking up in the sky hoping they would come back. You know, I wanted to see them again. And it wasn't until I was older that I recognized what aircraft that it was. And then uh, when my dad highly encouraged me uh, to go in the military, he did so by calling the Air Force recruiter and telling me what time to be there. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I, because he was Navy, and I went in the Air Force, and I, that old F-4 was still in always the back of my mind. And I remember seeing it a lot on the news watching the Vietnam War. And, uh, and then I got stationed at Shaw Air Force Base down at Sumter. And at that time, we had a squadron of F-6, uh, we had three squadrons of F-16s and one squadron of F-4s. And I volunteered to go work with the F-4s. There was just something about that plane that was just a, a somewhat of a, a love affair to where I just wanted to be close to it because it truly looked and sounded like what a real fighter aircraft, I think, should look and sound. And so, uh, so that was a little bit of my experience, but then to be able to meet some of you uh, L4 drivers was, was, was quite an honor. And so I know that um, you, know, you, you finished flight school, and then you, uh, after you finished flight school, how long was it before you were sent to Vietnam? Well, you had to go through F4 radar school, which took about three months, and then the actual F4 flying training took uh, four months also. So I uh, got my wings in February of 66 and I was flying F-4 missions over North Vietnam in December of 66. Well, wow. uh, 24 so, year old first lieutenant. 24 years old, first lieutenant, one mm -hmm. month in with the F-4s and now you're flying missions. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is awesome. Now, I know that a lot of times people ask me about ribbons. Um, and, and I've been out so long, I can't remember what all these ribbons are. I sent my DD Form 214 to an organization called uh, Medals of America. They're actually out of Simpsonville, but they sip all over the world. And I said, here, build me a ribbon rack. And this is what they sent back to me. And so people ask me about it. And I, and I can tell you that, that whenever you see ribbons on, uh, on a person's uniform, you can be assured that they either did something really outstanding or they were in the right place at the right time with the right people that was able to be recognized. So most of mine, I'm gonna tell you straight up of it, it's just because I was at the right place at the right time with the right people, okay? I mean, other than maybe uh, good conduct, that one's all mine. I was good conduct, but the rest of it, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. But Colonel, you've got some on over there that I want you to tell us a little bit about and start with the whichever one and tell us what they what they represent because those are those well are the one up on top is a silver star that's uh, the third highest award for valor medal of honors first and then your service cross the second it was for this mission that we pushed the other airplane mm -hmm. uh, this one here is one of three distinguished flying crosses I got uh, one each for shooting down an enemy fighter in a dogfight over North Vietnam. Uh, so two MiG-17s. And then the uh, Purple Heart was also for the push mission that uh, 
we'd uh, taken 100 millimeter fire over the target in North Vietnam and then ended up half, after pushing the other guy uh, because of our damage and lack of fuel, we couldn't make it back to the tanker either. So we had to eject and go down in the uh, jungles of northern Wales. Yeah. And uh, so, so it's not, that. you know, I always say it's a, a, you don't earn the Purple Heart, you get awarded for it because you got shot or something. Yeah. But, you know, I wasn't like a, a Army or a Marine guy on the ground that took a, a shot from a rifle or a machine gun or, or stepped on a landmine or something like that. Uh, ejecting out of the aircraft because you got, your airplane got shot down and then uh, injuries suffered and coming down through the uh, tall jungle trees and not doing a very good parachute landing because the trees are turning you ever which way but loose. We're going we're, we're gonna to talk some more about that just in a moment because yeah. that's going to be a great story. Okay. But talk about, just out of curiosity, I know some of you all are military buffs perhaps or maybe you serve in the Air Force. Uh, how many of you all know who Robin Oles was? Anybody? Okay, one. All right. He flew back to seat for Robin Oles. So that, Phil, you understand what an honor that is. Robin Oles was the uh, wing commander. He was wing commander, but he was also a, a, an ace. Triple ace from World War II. Yeah, triple ace from World War II, and then in, in Vietnam and things like that. So uh, just a little bit of history there. But, um, well, Colonel, let's, let, let's come up now to the man, the legend, Bob Pardo. Uh, how did you, now, Bob Pardo was flying the F-4 that you were in that day but y'all were already somewhat teamed up even before that particular day. You want to tell us about how you got teamed up with Bob Pardo? Well, we went through F-4 school together down in Tampa, Florida, McDill Air Force Base, and, and got to know each other pretty well. Actually didn't fly together at all during training. And uh, on the way over to Vietnam, we had to go through Jungle Survival School in the Philippines for three weeks. And then we were flying on a 130 over to Thailand where we were going to be stationed. He asked me if, uh, if he could arrange it, would we like to fly together? And uh, instead of immediately saying yes, you know, went through my head, well, let's see, this guy just finished first in formation flying, first in dive bombing, uh, first in every category. The only drawback was he finished first in academics, too, so that's a downer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so I said, sure. So, uh, but the rules were once you got to the wing, a new backseater flew with a experienced front seater for your first 15, 15 missions, and vice versa. He flew with an experienced backseater his first 15 missions. So after those 30 missions were over, we did fly together practically the rest of the time. Had a total of 100 missions over North Vietnam and 26 in Laos, and uh, probably flew at least 85 to 90 missions together with him. Wow, wow, all right. And then there was this day, 10 March, correct? Yes. 1967. Mm -hmm. Lay out for us a little bit about what that day's mission was, what was, was like, how, you know, well, the, tell us about the mission. Okay, the, the target was the, uh, well, biggest, I think really the only steel mill in North Vietnam. It's located 30 miles north of Hanoi, right along a place called Thud Ridge, it was a short mountain ridge like you see from town here, but uh, the F-105 was called a Thunder Chief, but affectionately known as the Thud, and that ridge was called Thud Ridge because they lost a lot of 105s in that area. But we had a task force of 70 total airplanes, most of them fighters, F-105s, we have fours escorting them, and then also dropping our bombs on target uh, unless we got attacked by MiGs on the way in and we didn't. So you uh, 
they knew we were coming because about a week before we tried to hit the same target and the weather forecast was a lot worse than what we were told, so we just flew over the target and had to come back. And uh, so it gave them time to add more AAA guns and service air missile sites. And, and according to guys like Robin Olds, our wing commander who fought World War II, uh, you know, he said that it was the most defended target he had ever seen. Yeah. And uh, so on so, so, so all that day, you knew that part of your mission was that flying the F-4, you were going to be flying support mission to the 105s by protecting them from the enemy aircraft trying to come up, right? Yes. But, but none, if there was none came up, then y'all would make your run on in. But if any enemies came up, you would jettison your weapons, your, 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 uh, your bombs. Fuel and, tanks. Fuel tanks, and you would dogfight with the MiGs, right? Right. And then... So none came up that day, so we carried, uh, besides our eight air-to-air -air missiles, we had uh, eight, well, eight air-to-air -air missiles, and then we also had uh, six 750-pound bombs. Okay. So we, uh, and then a high-threat target like that, it was, it was, the bomb run was kind of exciting because you start from about 12,000 feet and uh, 60 degrees of dive at 600 knots. Or hurling your body toward the ground. <laughs> and then uh, at that speed, you had to uh, hit the pickle button, as you call it, to release your bombs at about 9,200 foot above the ground level in order to give you time enough to pull out at the bottom end without hitting the ground and giving you some clearance. Uh, you wanted to pull out by 4,000 feet, so small armored fire. And, couldn't come up that high. And doing over 600 knots at 4,000 feet, you're going to be in the ground if you don't pull up in just a matter of seconds. Right. So, yeah. There's a older VHS video of actually an interview with Bob Pardo, who was the front seat pilot uh, on that day, that we're going to watch at this time. And so uh, sit back and enjoy. We're approaching the Red River when our number four man in our formation uh, made it known that he was critically low on the field. It became obvious that uh, he wasn't going to make it back to the refueling tanker, so I thought I'd uh, do what I could to help him along. I thought possibly I might be able to get the nose of my airplane up against the tail of his and give him a push. I don't think, uh, had I thought about it to any great extent prior to the event, that I probably would have done. I think it is merely something that uh, happened at the time. You have to be crazy to do what he did, uh, in, a, in a sense. Uh, he, this was the front seater of the F-4 uh, that we pushed, Earl Lehman. To do something that, uh, as far as we were aware at the time, no, had not been done before. Bob Pardo and Earl Amon were captains in 1967, stationed at Ubon Royal Thai Air Base, Thailand. I'm in the, I'm in the green hat and black March 10th, suit. 1967, <laughs> backseater Bob Houghton, Earl Amon, Bob Pardo, and his backseater Steve Wayne were in the same flight on a bombing raid over North Vietnam. It was the first raid on the Thai Nguyen steel mill, which was one of the most heavily defended targets in North Vietnam. About 20 miles from the target, you didn't have to concern yourself with navigation any longer because uh, you could locate the target simply by the amount of flak that was present. Captain Amon was the last of 44 attacking aircraft. As he came off the target, his aircraft was hit by two sledgehammer blows. Looking down at his instrument panel to assess the damage, Amon found that he was losing fuel. Ordinarily, he should have 7,000 pounds of fuel left, but his fuel gauge read 2,000 pounds and was rapidly dropping. Realizing that he wasn't going to make it to the refueling tanker, 
He quickly climbed to 36,000 feet to improve his gliding distance after his fuel ran out. Captain Pardo followed, trying to figure out some way to assist Eamon. It just sort of occurred to me that if he would jettison the drag chute, perhaps I could put the radon with my airplane in the drag chute compartment and push him towards the tanker. After Eamon jettisoned his drag chute, Pardo tried to move in behind Eamon, but the turbulence from the aircraft was too great. The only thing left was if he would extend his tail hook, perhaps the tail hook would extend down below most of the wash. Earl was very critically low on fuel. I suggested that he shut the engines down and save that little bit of fuel. We moved in under him again and were able to get the tail hook of his airplane up against our windscreen. The hook is swiveled and he could only push when we were directly aligned with one another. As soon as the alignment was off, even slightly, the hook would slip off of his aircraft. So we would push for maybe 15 or 20 seconds uh, and lose our balance and slide off to the side. Back up and reposition, come in and do it again. And uh, although the tanker was still pretty far south, I thought with the push that we might uh, make it and not have to eject. The windshield did start to crack, uh, sort of like a spider web, I guess. There's a, a small piece of, of metal that extends off the bottom of the hook that was gouging holes in it. And the more it began to look like a spider web, the more concerned I became. Uh, I was afraid that if the windshield did break, that uh, I wouldn't have time to get the throttles in idle and back away from it before it hit me. So I decided that uh, I would move the hook down below the windshield. There's a small metal area just below the windshield, uh, just about the size of the, the shoe on the tail hook. And so we put it down there and continued to push. We pushed him an additional 88 miles, far enough to be in friendly territory in Laos. When we got down to about 6,000 feet above the ground, we decided that that was about as low as we dared go. It was time that we got out from under him and let he and his backseater eject. As soon as that happened, we saw both parachutes open. We did not have enough fuel to make it to the tanker. Steve and I ejected. In combat, you're taught flight integrity, where it's a team effort. Everybody supports everybody else. So even though Earl's airplane was shot up and it was obvious that he was going down, I did not see how I could not stay with him. To me, Bardo and his back seat, Steve Wayne, are both heroes. They risked themselves for Bob Houghton and myself. I, I asked Bob as soon as we were on the ground, why, why would you do such a thing? And I don't have much of an answer other than uh, I just couldn't leave him behind. Wow. Yeah. I know that there's a lot more to that story. That's just five minutes, and I know that I've watched documentaries that lasted almost an hour about a lot about that. But I know that uh, Bob Pardo might have been the front seat driver, but because you weren't going nowhere, you were in the back seat just as committed as what he was. And I know that the jeopardy that you all put yourselves in to rescue those guys is just phenomenal. It truly it is. Um, Colonel, I know that, that you know, as, as Bob said, that had never been tried before. And I'm going to let you tell a bit more about your experience with that, and then I'm going to go into about what happened after the fact. But. Okay, well, uh, it is the only time in the history of aviation, going all the way back to Orville and Wilbur, that an airplane has pushed another airplane. So uh, there's only two guys on Earth that can say they helped that. But, uh, yeah, they don't teach you that in training, do they? No. <laughs> and uh, I know the, uh, the directive was, don't anybody ever try it again, out of the four-star general down in Saigon. But uh, no, it, it, there's another interview with Bob that uh, the interviewer asked him, well, wh why did you do that? 
And it went, it, Bob's answer went further to say, really because of my dad. He said, if I'd went back to Texas after the war, and my dad asked me, well, what did you do to try to help? And if I'd said nothing, my dad would have probably disowned me. So I had to do something. And that's what he and I kind of came up with. You know, we just didn't go in there and do it. He and I talked over, you know, what do you think we can do? Well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll try and order what, what uh, you know, he said we tried to do. And uh, it was something, like was said earlier, you know, if you had to do it all over again, you'd certainly do exactly the same thing. It's iffy whether because of, back then the airplanes didn't have self, uh, fuel bladders that if you got a hole in it back in those airplanes, fuel leaked out. If you had a hole in the wing big as your finger, it leaked out a lot slower than if the hole was that big. So besides both your engines burning fuel, the size of the holes in your wing depended how fast you lost fuel. And uh, we figured we were hit with 100 millimeter shells, which is a big shell. And uh, for you Army guys, while you flew, you're, you shot 105 howitzers on the ground. That uh, so 100 uh, caliber shells, not much smaller than that. Now y'all were, as you were going in, both aircraft were shot, right? Well, Earl's airplane was damaged uh, probably about 70 miles before we got to the target. And uh, the rules were if you, he was supposed to turn around and abort the mission. But because you never aborted alone, he would have had to abort, you know, with his wing element, wingman, and have both airplanes leave the area. And Earl wasn't willing to do that. He said, things aren't bad right now, so we'll, we'll keep going to the target. And then when he got hit again at the target with more holes, then that's when he knew he wasn't going to make it back to the tanker. So, but, uh, and, and, ju and just for clarity, he could not, uh, Earl and, and, and Bob could not make it back. But technically, you and Bob Pardo could have made it back to your tanker, right? Possibly. But you chose yeah. to stay with your wingman. Yeah. And, uh, it's like the Army and Marine guys know you never leave a guy behind. Yeah. You know, whether he's still alive or not, you try to bring him out of the area back with your, your units. And basically, that's what we were doing. Yeah. And, um, you know, in... in I know that whenever y'all got back to the base, <clears throat> your fellow pilots and all your ground crews and others, boy, y'all were instant heroes, wasn't you? Yeah. But then the uppers didn't care for it, did they? Well, the four-star uh, General Momar, commander of 7th Air Force down in Saigon, never believed that our airplane had been hit because we didn't make a radio transmission to say we were. Because uh, Bob, part of those, I, uh, Leeds got enough problems with Earl's problems, I'm not going to add in mine to it. Yeah. So there was never a transmission about us getting hit. And to let you know how bad we did get hit, uh, as soon as the shells impacted, we lost uh, both generators, each engine, probably out of the 24 warning lights on the, your warning light panel. We probably had at least 18 of them on. Yeah. Uh, you also had we, an engine fire too, didn't you? Uh, yeah, we got the generators reset. Uh, had a fire on the left engine. Had to shut it down. Uh, after we got into actually pushing Earl, we decided we'd try to restart that left engine. Well. As soon as we restarted, we got a fire warning light again. So we had to do all the pushing with just one engine. One engine. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, so um, y'all were actually threatened to be court-martialed for your actions originally from the, from the uppers, did you not? Well, the one upper, yeah, the four star, uh, and uh, Robin Olds, a wing commander, happened to be on R and R, and didn't get back to like the day after we were re all four recovered. So he got in his F four and flew down to Saigon and said to the general, "You know, you're not going to uh, court martial these guys. Heck, they saved the lives of two guys." And uh, so the general really and said, okay, but never put them in for, for any kind of decorations. And then the general put out an order that nobody else over there ever tried to push another airplane again. But then 1989 came around. Yep, as uh, we ended up, well, Bob, I think, was at a uh, river rat convention, and, and uh, one of the guys asked him what we got for the award for doing that, and he said, well, nothing. And so this guy worked for, uh, his name was named John Itar's name, a senator from Texas. So he, he resubmitted the uh, award for us, and we ended up getting the Silver Star presented down at Shaw yeah. Yeah. here about 26 years after the fact. Well, Colonel, I know there's so much more, and I, I'm going to uh, let, let's transition to now what happened to Earl Amon later. Okay. Well, this wasn't the only time we tried to help save Earl's life. We were successful that time. But uh, about 1993, he was flying with UPS, and uh, to cut the story short, he, uh, he ended up being diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, most people with that disease live less than two years after being diagnosed. Earl ended up living five. So during that time, uh, Bob called me and said, Earl's in trouble, we gotta help him again. Okay, so Bob, uh, got this artist, you see the print here, last name is Ferguson, that did this print, did a thousand of them. I think you have number 778? That's correct. Yeah, I got number two. I wonder who's got <laughs> but, number one. <laughs> yeah, Bob. But uh, anyway, we sold those prints to uh, to try to help what we could with, uh, with Earl's problems. But what really got the ball rolling was we asked the artists if we could use the print on the backs of T-shirts and get T-shirts made. Well, we initially had 3,000 T-shirts made. They were sold in about two weeks. So we ordered another 3,000. Ended up, we made over $120,000 and selling t-shirts with that print on the back. Yeah. And uh, we were able to get Earl a, a motorized wheelchair. Uh, when he lost his voice due to the disease, we were able to get him a you know, voice synthesizer thing he could type in on a keyboard and the computer talked for him. Yeah. And, and then of course uh, later on he lost mobility in his fingers, so he couldn't use that anymore. So they, they had a little uh, chalkboard about this big with a, taped on it the uh, letters of the alphabet, and Earl could point one letter at a time for what word he wanted, wanted you to get. Well, Colonel, we don't have um, one of the Pardo Push t-shirts, but for coming today, and it did not make it in time, I actually, I got you this this T-shirt that says, "Never underestimate an old man who flew in an F-4 Phantom." <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> so, Thank you. So, it'll be Thank coming you. to you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Colonel, anything else you would like to share about that mission, about that day? Well, uh, Pastor Daniel asked me about a week ago. Uh, do you have a favorite 
passage from the Bible. And I said, well, I don't always like the 23rd Psalm. And in particularly, I didn't tell him that, but in particularly the fourth verse. You know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort thee. Well, I tell you, when I landed in the jungle in northern Laos, uh, the North Vietnamese had Ho Chi Minh trails going down through Laos, too. It wasn't a particular friendly country. But uh, looking back on the fact, I didn't, I have to admit, I didn't really think of that verse and psalm at that moment. I was on the ground. But looking back, I was completely 100% assured that I was going to be rescued before nightfall. And I only spent one hour and seven minutes on the ground wow. uh, because the helicopters were rescuing Earl Amon and Bob Houghton before they came over and rescued us. I'll, I'll, but I'll... Uh, looking back on that verse, very apropos. I know that one of the other things was that Bob Pardo was flying, trying to get south. It was Steve Wayne who told him, no, turn north, different heading, because you knew where there was a friendlier base that y'all would be rescued closer if you ejected in that area than if you kept heading south, correct? Yeah, if we headed straight south, which was directly toward the tankers and home, I uh, figured that we were going to eject probably very near Ban Ban which was a town in Laos that was the North Vietnamese headquarters. I said, we don't want to do that because yeah. they're not going to send us to Hanoi Hilton POWs. They'll yeah. end up just probably killing us. So yeah. I said, turn back up to the northwest. We'll try to get to the Lima site, which the helicopters flew out of. Air Force Special Forces guys would go in and clear out an area about as big as the room here to uh, get a couple of helicopters in pre-positioned to rescue guys like on a big mission like this. And this particular mission, we lost six fighters that day. R2 F4s and then six F105s. And none of the six 105 pilots made it. Well, Colonel, we're glad that you're here with us today. Well, Once thank again, you. Once again, been my honor, Appreciate my it. privilege. Uh, and God bless you, buddy. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank all of you. Yeah. And to all other veterans, thanks for all your service. The goal is not to see how high you can go, but to see how many you can lift up with you in the process. As I was struggling about wanting to get out of the Air Force and go into the ministry, and God was calling me, I love the Air Force. You cut me, I bled Air Force belief. But then one day, I walked into the 9th Air Force where I was doing some work for them, and there was the painting. And when I read the mission and I saw what had happened, it was a God moment. Because I realized, Daniel, that's your mission now. You see, both aircraft were shot up. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can say we haven't been shot by sin. But then as being a pastor, God wanted me to take what I've got to be able to come up under other people and help push them on to glory and to safety. Man, I stood there at night Air Force headquarters and tears rolling down my eyes because God was speaking to me. I knew that was it. Now, I didn't go looking, God speak to me through one of these paintings. No, it just happened to be that particular place, that particular time, but then I just kind of solidified it. And so the goal in life, once again, is, is not to see how high you can go, but to see how many you can lift up in the process. The Bible tells us in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Dear brothers and sisters, if any believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. When I look at that picture that hangs in my office, I think about Galatians 6, 1 and 2 and I also think about a cord of three strands that's not easily broken. 
And that is that whenever we are coupled with a partner, a wingman, and with God, he can do much with us. In, in the testimonies in which you have just heard, I just want to just pull some of the things that Colonel Wayne shared and, and, and relate it back to some of our spiritual life. And that is that first off, he, he came from a military family. His dad served in, in World War II. Most people that accept Christ come from a Christian family where the love of God was, was expressed and, and, and shown. So the greatest example is not the church. The greatest example is what happens inside of your house. And then at a very young age, he set out a goal that he wanted to be a fighter pilot. What if at a very young age, a young person that we minister to, that, that we uh, have Bible club for, or Sunday school for, says, I want to live my life out for Christ. I may not be a preacher or a missionary or something like that, but I want to live my life for Christ. And they set out on that goal. Wow, what a blessing that they won't have to go through so much of the heartache. But then we also know that on that day, but by the way, I forgot to tell this right here. On 10 March 1967 was actually Bob Pardo's birthday. He turned 33, I think, on that day. Yes. What an iconic age to turn on that day. And he says now that, that, and he even told me this on the phone, I talked to him just recently, he doesn't have a birthday, he has an anniversary every year. And where his age may be one thing, but the anniversary of, of that 10 March 67 is an anniversary date, and that's what he celebrates. What's your spiritual birthday? What day was it that somebody came under you and helped push you on towards understanding who Jesus is? Do you have an anniversary of that? That's why whenever I lead people to Christ, I always tell them, take your Bible, write today's date in it, let that be your birth certificate, and go back and look at it and, and, and remember that day. But on that day, they were on a dual mission. They were going to bomb this highly defended steel mill. And the North Vietnam thought a lot of their steel mill, and they put all their defenses they possibly could on it. But these guys were also not only responsible for going and bombing it, but they were to protect the other aircraft in the air. That if the MiGs, the, the enemies took off, they would skip to a different mode and go take care of the enemy. We cannot become so myopic in our life that we think that only making a living and, and, and having a house and, and seeking out happiness is all we're supposed to be about. But instead, we're on a dual mission, and that is we should be ready to always share the faith with somebody else. Because see, God, is your, you know, as, as he's our Heavenly Father, we're his children, he's got us on a mission right here. And your mission field is wherever it is that God has you to go. Your work, your school, your place of play, your neighborhood, wherever it is. And so be ready to always be on God's mission. But you know, Colonel Wayne did not just decide one day. He showed up at an Air Force base, picked out an aircraft and said, I believe I like this one right here. <laughs> you, know, you do that with used cars. You don't do that with United States Air Force fighter uh, planes. But instead... He had to go through training in order to get to that place where he could then fly the F-4. I know that, did you not try out for the Thunderbirds at one time? Mm. Yeah, he, he, he became such a good pilot, he actually tried out for the Thunderbirds. And they said, no, you're too good. You need to go back to fighting <laughs> uh, fighter aircraft in the air. At least that's how I'm gonna tell the story. <laughs> and so, but you know, where it is that God wants you to be, he prepares you and he gives you training. That's the importance of church. I hear people all the time say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You're right. But if you're a Christian, you want the training and you get the training inside the church. But just like what he was partnered up with, with, with Bob Pardo in flight school and then later on on a mission, you never know who God might be partnering you up with at church to be able to go out and do a mission to be able to help somebody else. So yeah, church is really just that important. And, and then we also know that, that, whenever, that whenever Earl Amon's aircraft was shot up and he was losing fuel and it was on fire and he was not gonna be able to make back the tanker and he was not gonna be able to get out of the country, they could have said, see ya, uh, best of luck. We're going home. We're gonna go catch the tanker. We're gonna get on out of here. 
But instead, as he was taught with flight integrity, you stay with your wingman. That's why here in the church, we want to stay with each other. If you're struggling with sin because you've been shot up, we're not going to throw you out. We're going to come along and we're going to try to push you towards safety gently as long as what you don't try to fight us. And so, you know, knowing that we are here one for another, and here again, the mission of the church. But, you know, if we don't have people inside the church, who's going to partner? Who's our wingman now? You're not flying solo in life, folks. And whenever life gets tough, it's the church is one of the places where you should be able to turn to and receive help. But, you know, if not people are here, you can't, we can't give as much help. But you hear... You're here because God wants to use you in the mission of Bethel Baptist Church, which is, say it with me, make Christ known in Berea and beyond. Be our wingman. And then I pointed out also about how that um, the, the four-star general didn't like what y'all had done and uh, was even up for a court-martial. Robin Oles, when he was on R&R, he came back to the base, heard about what had happened, and um, Chappie, uh, um, James, James Chappie, um, they, uh, he had not really stood up to the general, but Robin Oles, if you do the history and everything, that man feared no one, <laughs> and he, when he got back and heard about it, he told him, hey, get me an F-4 ready, I'm going to Saigon, I'm going to talk to him. Right? And he flew down there and he stood up for these guys and protected them. Now it took 20 something years later before they ever actually got the recognition and got the medal. But you know what I was kind of reminded of? And that is Pharisees don't really understand what all it takes in order to accomplish the mission. So, you know, there's going to be people that maybe don't necessarily like maybe what you did on your mission in life to be able to help save somebody else. Your boss at work, your teacher at school may not like the fact that maybe you're a Christian and you live out your Christian life in public and in private so that others might be able to see the glory of God in you. And so you know what? We can expect some turmoil even from the inside. Sometimes the enemy's not the ones you know, on the outside. Sometimes it's within our own camp. But I want to bring it all back to this right here. Bob Pardo said that whenever he got back home to Texas, and if his dad would have said, what did you do? And if he would have said, nothing, he knew he would have disappointed his father. What about whenever this life of ours is over and we're standing before a righteous and holy God and his son Jesus, our judge, and he says, what did you do to help push others on to safety, to glory? Are you going to say, nothing? Or will you be able to say, Lord, I followed the mission to not to see how much glory I could get or how high I could go, but instead to see how many others I could lift up. And then that's whenever we hear our Father say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's why this painting spoke to my heart many years ago. That's why I have looked at it as being my life's mission. And that's why I count it such a blessing to be able to call Stephen Wayne a friend and to be able to know him and then just to be able to meet and talk with Bob Pardo. God uses uncommon circumstances and situations to affect us in different ways. Because I want to remind you of something. On 10 March 1967, I wasn't but five months old. I was five months, I was born in November, November the 16th, next week, <laughs> 1966. <coughs> These men didn't know me and I didn't know them. 
But on 10 March 1967, they saved a couple of guys' lives that then affected my life many years later. You never know what you're doing today and whom it may affect in the future. So live your life for God so that others may be able to say, wow, you know, he or she, they touched me in such a way. You may never meet the people that we give the socks and the underwear and the, and the clothes and the coats and the jackets and the gloves to. You may never meet them, but somewhere along the line, they might come back and say, you remember that church over there in Berea called Bethel? They helped me out. We've had people from the food pantry come back and tell us about how that they were here. I, I, there's hardly a month that doesn't go by that somebody doesn't tell me how that they grew up in our daycare or their kids went to our daycare. And they remember, you know, our, our daycare workers and, and, and ones like that. So folks, what's your mission? May we all be on God's mission. And we know that in order to be on God's mission, we have to seek Him first. And then let all these other things fall into place. And today, if you've not put Christ first in your life by accepting His salvation, we, we invite you to come to know Him. And I want to talk with you, I want to pray with you, I want to show you from the Scriptures. And then also, if, if you know that you're in this mission, but maybe you've been shot up some, and maybe, maybe you need some help, drop a tail hook. We'll come underneath you, and we'll help you. But let's seek God first.